Thank you. I'm told I have to look into the talk into the mic and look out here and look here, and then somebody's got to grab this and move it out of the way so that our guests can say. By the way, are you guys are you going to come sit up here? So are you going to? Why don't you go up? Why don't? Why don't we let them get up in position so that when I turn it over, we won't have any any craziness. Um. Welcome to Book Passage. This is a great crowd, and I really appreciate uh, everyone who's here. And uh, in addition, we have a significant crowd of people online watching this, so that's why we're doing the, the cameras and the... They can't hear you. They can't hear me. Every time, every time I do this, somebody says they can't hear me. I have to point it here, swallow the microphone, do whatever I have to do. Um, are we okay? Eric, can you hear me? Okay, okay, all right. Anyway, well, this is really an exciting, exciting event with an exciting book and a couple of really real pros here. I think you have to be as old as I am to have any real conception of what life was like in the straight-laced, button-down world of America prior to the revolution, the cultural revolutions of the 60s and 70s. It was, um, those events in the, have ushered in all kinds of changes. And we're still feeling profound social, uh, cultural, musical changes. We're still feeling the uh, impact of it, particularly in Northern California. And we're lucky this evening to have two people who chronicled those changes as they were happening, and right, he right here in the Bay Area, both in, both in both cases. Both of them were here when the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the uh, anti-Vietnam War movement, um, the free speech movement, all of them had an impact. And these changes not only affected the music world, but the broader cultural world around it. And it was those, cul those cultural changes, I think, that were the impetus for Jan Wenner and others to begin the publication of Rolling Stone magazine. And that magazine became a, kind of a symbol of the era. And it was, you know, it was an enormous impact. Now, the entire story of that is really rather brilliantly recorded in the book that we're celebrating tonight, Like a Rolling Stone. And that's which is me a winner's memoir of those years. And when we weren't reading about those exciting changes in Rolling Stone, we could, we could read Ben Fong Torres in the Chronicle and the other publications, and in Rolling Stone, where he wrote for a while. Um, and... Uh, Ten goddamn years. I was going to say you covered it with brilliant writing, but it was ten goddamn years. That's another way, another way of putting it. So, without any further interference, or without holding the mic or dropping it or doing whatever I shouldn't do, I'm going to turn the. Uh, you guys are all sitting down. You're all ready to go. You're not, you don't need that right at the minute. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Jan Winter and Ben Fong Torres. And Ben, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. First, uh, welcome home, Jan. Thank you very much. Good. Good. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Does someone boo? Good to be back home. <laughs> yeah, it is. This is one. And oh, we want to thank yeah. you. Okay. Now, okay. Yeah, uh, close. It's like singers. Um, we want to thank you for writing this book and also for not doing what was apparently going to be the case when I first heard from you about this project. Is that you were swimming over 700 pages into Obama territory. <laughs> and if you had kept doing that, this is how his book would have looked. <laughs> it could have been, huh? It should have been. It should have been. That's a lot of the, the original. The, the book you have is long, I'm told, the long book, and it's 580 pages, something like that. This is less than half of what I originally turned in. Wow. And a, a part of it was I just, the reason it was so long is, a part of it, I was writing stuff I knew would never make the book, but I just wanted to have the record of it and put it out and have it there for my kids and all this stuff. And 
and in writing, you never know what's going to work and what's not going to work until you kind of try it out. And then I had, I had appointment books and diaries from really the very almost the first week of Rolling Stone of who I was seeing, and they were my assistants were always keeping. I had it for fifty years of appointments, and my, w and and then I had the record of Rolling Stone itself, the fifty years of Rolling Stone, and I was a, a, a pack rat saver as a kid when I was growing up at Santa Fe. And I had cards for my mom when I go to camp and letters she wrote. And I just had everything. So, you know, just you just kind of write everything you got in front of you. And it was massive. And the first, and then I'll stop talking. But uh, obviously I'm along with it. But um, there for, and I and just enjoyed writing about all these vacations I took. I used to travel quite a bit and have a lot of fun in traveling. And never really worked all that hard and traveled a lot. And so. You write up all these fun things you have, but then you get the end and go, it's like what, what, looking at somebody's travel slides. I mean, who, who really wants to see another new picture of a tiger <laughs> or a pyramid? I mean, forget it. So that went. Anyway, it got cut down uh, considerably, and, and I finally realized that you, know, every, that you really have to abandon a lot of ideas of what you think are great and just really put, put it to the test of the reader. As Whenever you read a book, don't you? Sometimes you get to a section in there, a passion, you think, I'm just going through this because I've got to get to the next thing, you know? <laughs> and I don't really want, you know, know all this stuff about whatever it is. And then you've got to cut that stuff out. Uh, but they just must have been moving. painful cuts to go 500 pages out. Uh, you're thinking maybe a volume two? <laughs> <laughs> I was going <laughs> to... People urged it, said that, but I thought, just get it all done at once. It's, you, you know, all, maybe all the good stuff's in the front when Ben and I were working well. together and maybe get it back, but make them read it all, I thought. I came, I came up with like 50 questions for you and had to painfully cut them down to about 20. So I, I feel you. I feel you. Yeah. All right. But regardless of that, let's have a little uh, nonsense here now. Your book and my documentary, now on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> are entitled Like a Rolling Stone. What? Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, fucking. Oh, my. Where's God. your attorney? Uh, <laughs> So we can sue each other over that. But then <laughs> Dylan could sue the both of us, and then the Stones could sue the three of us, and then the estate of Muddy Waters could sue all eight of us. <laughs> Finally, Mr. Waters gets his due. Oh, uh, Henry had a newspaper in Texas called The Rolling Stone. Ah. Yeah. So and, oh, I didn't bring it, but there's a 1924 novel called Rhymes of a Rolling Stone. I didn't bring it, but Moses came down from the mount. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do I need so to explain this to you? No, you don't. Because okay. huh. you, you addressed it in uh, your interview, your incredible two-page interview with Maureen Dowd of the New York Times. Right. Uh, in a session of Confirm or Deny, she said... Keith Richards accused you of nicking the name of his band, and you said, true. True, he did. But she didn't finish. Keith Richards said, not only did uh, you nick, my kids are named, I've got a kid named Alexander and a kid named Theodore and another son named Gus. Wow. His daughters are Alexander and Theodora, and his father is Gus. <laughs> And he said, and then on top of that, you stole my name, the man. <laughs> he said, you must Sorry, be stoned, Mick. Keith. <laughs> and she said that Bob Dylan was jealous that you gave the Rolling Stones credit for the name of the magazine. Mick said that without him and Keith, the magazine would have been called something else. You got it? Yeah. I was inducting the Stones into the VMA or MTV Hall of Fame or something like that. Ah, okay. And so I... I and I said, you know, I'm not going to visit. And I really thank you for the name Rolling Stone. You know, you're inducting the Rolling Stones. What are you supposed to say? So he says, well, you know, without us, you were, your magazine would have been called Herman's Hermits Monthly. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, a week later, as it turns out, I went to an MTV unplug session that they were doing with Bob Dylan. And after the session, I was upstairs with Bob. And he says, I saw, on, I saw on the TV last night that you gave the Rolling Stones credit for the name, and you know perfectly well that you got it from me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, why, how could you do that? And I kind of fudged and said, you know, I gave the credit to everybody. And the truth, in the first issue of Rolling Stone, and acknowledged, well, it was after Bob Dylan's song, Like a Rolling Stone. So what did, what did he say? I think it after me. I don't know where. Anyway, but the, point, the point is and how, how flattering 
can you get? You know, oh, really? the, the two greatest, you know, fighting over the credit for it. <laughs> yeah, wow. And uh, and then he makes this movie like a Rolling Stone, <laughs> without Sorry. the pain that I've gone through over this. <laughs> You know, this, yeah, I'm, I'm glad it worked out the way it did because it could have been on the cover of the Hermits, Hermits Weekly. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> not, not quite as catchy a but, song. Uh, that was pretty catchy. Well, thank you. Ben is so, in my, one of the pages, things I didn't cover in my book was Ben's lyrics, parody <laughs> lyrics, to You've Got to Serve Somebody, which we performed at a Christmas party. Did you want to read those? Yeah. Right now? Um, Let's see if I can find them. Yeah. I, well, I don't want to cut it. I think it's that. two four. We'll, we'll do it later. Oh, As you got the page number. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think it's 289. But I, I, I'm not sure. I, I was just research. I, I researched for this, kids. <laughs> this doesn't just come off the top of the uh, head here. Uh, but while he's looking, I'll say that this is an interview, but sometimes we will drift into actual conversation. That's uh, because we have a lot of parallels. You wouldn't know, thinking, uh, looking at the two of us, but we were both born on a January 7th. 46, 45, and that's about our age combined. Uh, we both had working parents, did a bit of shoplifting, wanted to be a musician, whether singing or playing, and we both ran for school office. And we, got, we both got minor radio gigs early in life, we both avoided the draft, and we both interviewed for jobs with a phone company. <laughs> Finally, we both dug Elvis, and we listened to rock and roll music on a rocket transistor radio. So, there you are. I don't believe it. They've cut you out of the index, Ben. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry about that. Let's see. I'm sure. That, everybody looking there. Is Ben in this index? No. Okay. I can't find no. it. We'll find so it. We'll find all it. that stuff are parallels. Do you want to amplify, amplify on any of that in terms of you growing up with uh, not working parents? Your parents did really well, didn't they, with the baby formula? They did well, and they were they were hardworking parents. But I think, you know, we were both raised in a, as a part of the post-war baby boom, and uh, you know, we're at the beginning of. Now I'll tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, as, as a pre pre prologue to this book. Uh, and we were both the part, the, the leading edge of what turned out to be the largest population cohort in American history, the best educated cohort of Americans in history, and the wealthiest. Uh, all the rewards of the of the post-war boom and the peace were disposed upon us, and we grow up into a expanding America of goods and services and schools that were custom built for our generation, and it just blew blew the, the whole thing up and. Uh, as we start, became young adults and started going to college, we, you know, ran really smack into the contradictions uh, of America. That, that as we started things, in addition to the usual youth rebellion, that things were not exactly as we had been promised or told they were, or the ideals that we were raised with, and in fact, we were kind of alienated from that kind of society that had been established. And we look looked out as we go to college and and see, well, right away, it's the whole bit about freedom and equal rights is just not true. Mm. You know, I mean, that whole classes of people were kept under, and the very first thing we were aware of was the situation of blacks. There was still this segregation, this cruelty, and lynch, on and on. So it was that the commitment of the generation to these kinds of ideas of social justice and equal rights and human rights and, and just general decency and humanity uh, were inculcated in us, and were, uh, in addition to some of the literature of the beatniks and some of the other minor literature and some of the literature of black liberation, like James Baldwin and so forth, uh, were brought all this kind of to our attention and instilled in the generation you know, a general attention to, to to rights of all people, to the rights of young people, of course, which we were all we we're, were all being ridic ridiculed, but to the rights of women, to gays, to blacks, to you know all kinds of minorities, and to the right, the what I think were the foundational principles of Rolling Stone, and showing the things I believe in, were the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think that was the notion which with I started Rolling Stone, and I think it was the notion was being expressed 
uh, in the voice of rock and roll people, of the early rock and roll people at the time, of Simon and Garfunkel and Dylan, the Stones, the Beatles. You could hear it everywhere. The, the drive for freedom and for liberty and for love and for openness and, and purpose. And that was became, was became the mission of Rolling Stone, to spread the word of rock and roll, which spread those words as well as just the sheer joy and pleasure and passion and originality of the music itself. And that's somehow well expressed. And that somehow leads us to got to suck somebody. <laughs> Many this, years later. Th this is in New York City. It's uh, what, a holiday party or an anniversary party? It was our annual Christmas party. Annual Christmas and party. And we just moved there. And um, uh, we, when in San Francisco, we used to have you know, editorial conferences every now and then. And so I thought it was good we'd have an editorial conference and when we got to New York. And instead of an editorial conference, it turned into just this drug-raging thing, <laughs> you know. I mean, there was no mood for an editorial conference. And everybody brought guitars and so on. Every, we, so we so enjoyed the jam session, we decided we would... People asked us to do it as a band at the annual Christmas party. So we... Uh, what was the name of the house band, by the way? It was called the... Dry heaves, wasn't That's it? That's right, dry <laughs> heaves. <laughs> it it kind of tells you the level, the standard here. But the, it's, and those people, who follow, if you follow music writing, the piano player was a guy named John Perales, who's today the head critic of New, New York Times. Uh, Chuck Young was in it. Mm -hmm. um, Her Loader was uh -huh. a guitar player. Uh, you were on a rhythm I was on guitar. guitar. Yep. And so anyway, we just I said if we're gonna do this, we take it seriously we're gonna have to rehearse. <laughs> so we used to call rehearsals because you know you, you can't just get up there and jam in front of a bunch of people. And uh as you set lists on stuff. So Ben submitted a song for us to do. That's right. Based on the uh Bob Dylan spiritual Dylan. tune Gotta Serve Somebody. You know that song by Dylan? You, you may, may know Paul Simon. You may know Elaine. You may know Jan Wenner. You may even know Jane. You may have home numbers for Ahmed or for Clive. You may know the cast of Saturday Night Live. But you're going to have to suck somebody. <laughs> uh -oh. He's going to fire goes, me again. It goes, goes, and then this is, it ends like this. You might like Rick Nelson or Ricky Lee Jones. Might like the sticks, might like the stones. Only that's like that. Some people are suckers, some people just get sucked. <laughs> some people suck blood and some people just suck. Oh, get sucked, <laughs> sucked, but you're going to have to suck somebody. <laughs> Smash hit. This is what happens when you work remotely. Yeah. <laughs> this is what happens when you let writers have too loose a line, you know? <laughs> um, so, the yeah. upshot of the, oh, but just to yeah. finish. So, I took a break, get off stage for a minute, I'm going to get back up. And there's Mick sitting right first row in front of me. He hadn't come to the show. And I, he, he pulled me up. He said, shake your ass more. <laughs> Sage advice. He's served him well for so many years beyond <laughs> age 30. Jan, this is your first book, and it took you three, I think, three years to put yeah. it together. What was the organizational editing writing process overall? Well, I... I had, after having really retired and after, you know, having a physical disability where I was not going to be able to run around anymore, I had the time to do it. And as you know, I mean, Ben was a very fast, prolific writer. But I think I, I was, my skills were very rusty, so you had to get back into it. And I realized the only way to really organize it was to do it chronologically, otherwise you get completely lost. And uh, I just got, and writing is not the easiest thing in the world. You know, it takes, it takes what, it takes time. You know, it takes time. You have to really think. And you, if you don't think about what you're about to write, you'll end up writing really quick cliches or predictable stuff, and you say, oh, well, that says nothing. And so to make it really sing and to be able to find the right words, which is kind of what all it's about, you have to really recall the situation you're writing about in real in, in a really intense way. You have to sit there and kind of close your eyes and think back to that particular situation, a person you're with or whatever it was, and feel... Immerse yourself in what you were feeling at the time and thinking and what you were seeing with the visual cues. And then it'll, then it'll start to come to you what the truth or the core of that event was, you know, and, and what you were feeling you t tend not to. But once you do that, of course, you find the words. You can start to describe it. It's fun finding that stuff within you, and you end up reliving it. I mean, so for three years, I relived all of my life, you know, and 
from camp and what it was like to be left alone and lonely to these things, the joy of the, and all kinds of occasions and stuff. It was really rich, you know, to do all that. But it was, it was exhausting and it really, and as it goes along, you find out sort of what it all meant and how it all pieced together and got structured and why one thing, which you don't understand at the time, now seems inevitable because as, as it formed a complete puzzle, we could put it all together. So it was a really enjoyable process, so all of it. You tapped uh, a number of your former fellow editors and writers and associates, uh, colleagues, to help you with different stages of uh, your career and the history of Rolling Stone, correct? And some of them did a little bit further than that. Would they help you to uh, look at some pivotal stories or major, major events and help bring back your memories? Not too much. Mm -hmm. um, I, well, for instance, I would call you, and I would want to go over the specific things that, you know, there's things that don't sit in my memory or do, that I don't remember, do remember. And it was kind of, I mean, I wasn't writing a book to interview everybody. I was writing, I wanted to write about everybody, and in the book I've explained about everybody, interesting what their background was or where they came from, or just because I think part of the book was wh who were all these people that got together with a sense of common person, purpose and mission? And, and of course, I was a key component, but everybody was part of it, and everybody, it was a story of a generation, really, so this was, I was going to tell this, these people where they came from. So, but I didn't want to interview people about their experience, it was going to be from mind point of view, but to clarify facts mm -hmm. and get a few things, that was what I talked to people about. And every time I did, not that many, maybe a dozen people yeah. of all that I s spoke to, but I'd have lunch with, I had lunch with Laurel, who I hadn't seen for like, wow. you know, so long, mm -hmm. and I had the best time. I, I mean, it was wow. like, she was just the same, and you just, yeah, it was, the these are wonderful things to do. Mm -hmm. I also tapped uh, three or four of my better editors to help me edit the book. Bob Wallace is one of our big managing editors at the time. Mm -hmm. Bob was Wallace. his principal editor. And, and uh, Paul, Paul Scanlon. Started it off. From, and sa from, from the Bay Area. Our first managing editor. Right. And then uh, do the final kind of edits on it, uh, John Cott and John Landau, who mm. are both issue one contributors and still dear friends of mine, right. who could edit it from sort of my sensibility. Were there shocks along the way as they told you stories? and I didn't learn anything. I mean, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, me, I didn't learn anything shocking. I learned a lot of interesting extra detail that I didn't know about something mm -hmm. at the time or what happened because they're, they had a different point of view or memory of something, and oftentimes I'd forget stuff. You know? oh. So I found stuff that was really fascinating. Well, let me yeah, remind you about one incident. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, on that HBO series uh, on the 50th anniversary of Rolling Stone called Stories from the Edge? Yeah. It began with uh, a, a, a segment about my article on Ike and Tina Turner. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then that was followed by you and Annie uh, reminiscing because she shot the story. Yeah. And gave me a lot of interesting right, information, uh -huh. especially about Ike. Uh -huh. And you said, Annie, didn't that, uh, what, what happened? There, there was something that happened where uh, Ike threatened you or, or me or something? Well, let me tell you, sir, because this is so clear in my mind still. The day Jody came by to my office in the music section and said, hey, Ben, uh, this is kind of weird, but have you had a leg or an arm broken recently? <laughs> uh, Jody, Jody, you're pretty observational. You would know. And so she said, well, there's a guy down at the uh, Hall of Justice telling the police that uh, he came, uh, he got busted, and he uh, is telling them the story that he was sent from Los Angeles by Ike Turner <laughs> to go to break one limb each of Jan Wenner and Ben Fontoris. He could have just written a letter to the editor, you yeah, know. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> but it didn't happen, obviously, yeah. the poor well, guy. Look, look at me now. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he's got a long memory, that guy. DIY, you yeah. did it yourself. No, 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 it's Mike. <laughs> Remember when Buddy Miles showed up at the office? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah tell yeah. that story. Buddy Miles did a sit-in in the reception uh, uh, Buddy area. is a uh, guy who's about 280 pounds, black guy, the drummer for the Electric Flag, and before that for Wilson Pick or whatever, but he had started his own group after the Bloomfield group, and we gave it a terrible review or something like that, and he showed up at the office to protest. He was bigger than anybody who worked in the office. I ran across the street. I went down the side stairwell across the street to Jerry's, and Dan Parker, who was our, the biggest guy, there's like only six foot or six one, went out to see him, and his buddy pinned him up you know, against the wall, and then he calmed down, left and all that stuff, but 
That was the most disgruntled, you know. Ben, excuse me. I ben wonder. stood there yeah. at the door, said, fuck you, buddy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't think you're getting across here to see Mr. Winner. <laughs> he's, he's beat up enough. I wonder well, how his next review did in Rolling Stone. I think we really, yeah, right. There was a next album. All right. One of the uh, motivations for doing this book, you have said, uh, was the previous uh, books about uh, Rolling Stone and you, and the most recent one, Sticky Fingers, in 2017, was especially disappointing to you. You had expected uh, journalistic history, and you got a book full of uh, gossip. And yet, you, Jan S. Winter, get very personal and gossipy in your own book. <laughs> one site called Inside Hook, in fact, ran a piece called Headlined, some of the cringiest things Jan Winner has said on his book tour. <laughs> Have you seen that piece? No, no. Oh, God. Oh, well, oh, wait, wait, I don't want to see that. The Where? examples aren't very cringy. You want to see it? No, I'm not really, oh, but okay. I have yeah. it afterwards. It was about uh, Britney Spears' cover. It was about um, your attitude about today's pop and rock and roll, uh -huh. how it's all being run by teenage girls. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> what else? I. Uh, but... They, they were really cringy, just controversial, and for a lot of young people, uh, or for her anyway, a young writer, it felt like, oh, this is just an old guy complaining about the new mm. music. <laughs> and he, he stuck with Springsteen and Dylan and mm -hmm. Bono and Mick. <laughs> so, but That's cool. Yeah, how's it been, though, for you to be on the other end of the review system? Well, um, the response I've gotten really has been extremely positive, except for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the <laughs> L.A. Times. And these three reviewers, more or less, uh, really take me, to f take me to task. And I fought for having have re led such a fun life. I mean, for, you know, having spent money, having enjoyed myself, having hung out with people of the stars, you know, and uh, they're angry about that, you know. And uh, this is not a new phenomenon to me throughout the history of Rolling Stone. That people really, we somehow we were lightning them off for so much controversy, and, and and really people who they call today the haters, you know, and and I, I had a good time and I enjoyed it and I enjoyed talking about it and telling stories and illustrating and explaining people who you've heard about and read about, but in a much more personal way than than you would ordinarily. And people we all look to and interested in. You I know? think uh, there are a couple of levels where there might be uh, people having problems with this. One is envy. And uh, yeah, absolutely. your jet set life. Yeah. And the other is that you kind of brag about it. You drop not only names, but <laughs> names of cities and parts of the world where you've jetted off to or sailed to, had a birthday party at, and then hung out with Ahmed at this place and Bruce at that place. And I think maybe that's this what is the author them. of the cringiest things. <laughs> <laughs> Colin. This, right this guy, this is the right. right. Yeah. But then the other point is they're saying, well, Rolling Stone, as uh, Lester Bangs said in Almost Famous, uh, is not supposed to make friends with the stars. And a, a lot of us, the uh, reporters and journalists, try to do that. You know, you can never be totally successful. How can you not befriend Huey Lewis? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> so, um, and yet they were saying you went overboard because you made financial deals with them and you uh, lived with them. The, and the, you know, there's so many different things that, I mean, I, I people were just resentful or angry or jealous or something like that, and gr begrudgingly acknowledge, even after reading this book, the 50 years of extraordinarily journalistic history and achievement and stuff and what we've done and what we stood for in our crusades and our politics and all this stuff, you know, but bitch at me for having had a fun life. And, uh, it, and the people we were covering... You know, these weren't politicians. These weren't people running corporations and making bad cars or t tobacco or any number of things. They were people, artists, you know, who were, you know, by and large, really nice people, friendly, doing good work, great work, making the world a happier and better place, putting out stuff that made us feel good. No, no, nobody was out to hurt us. Nobody needed that level of critical examination you'd give to a politician or whatever. And, uh... And furthermore, nobody really trespassed too often, too frequently, asking us for anything or any favors. We don't do it. Did we become friends at, at varying levels? Very degrees? We all did. These are all people we admired. They're like they were part of a group of people like ourselves, their selves, all of us serving together as big rock and roll stew, trying to get the same thing together. And, and we were their allies, and they were our allies. And we were putting out the same message and the same 
you know, magazine, and they were all eager to participate. I don't, I, we didn't, we didn't, nobody's ever pointed out any concrete case where we really shirked on anything or really pulled our punches. I mean, did we favors for people? Sure, but were they, we didn't put in any the covers of favor, you know? I mean, it was, it's so innocent, really, and uh, so well meant. And it gets distorted by the with the haters, whether it's this person who's doing that or whether it's the New York Times reviewer who just can't get over the fact and that they either missed this time or, I mean, what what could be what could be that wrong with what we did? I mean, so uh, I'm I, I don't my pay it. <laughs> Yes, I don't pay. I, I don't really pay that much. I don't get that involved in it you know, anymore. Mm. And I pay much attention to it. And, okay. and I've said what I have to say in my book, and I don't have to really defend that anymore. If they don't like it, they don't like it. Right. Let's go back to uh, near the beginning. Uh, I- you have written, and it was repeated in the uh, uh, session with Bruce Springsteen. At uh, Y nine Y ninety two ninety two N Y yeah it's either a radio station or a Y M C A center <laughs> not sure <laughs> what it is but that uh, you were born in in not just San Rafael but rural San Rafael where is that <laughs> long well, ago in a galaxy far away <laughs> there was a place called Los Ranchitos and the way you get to Los Ranchitos here is in that day, it was you'd go 101 North. Uh, 101 North was two lanes. Then, when it got out to where I live, just so north of just north of San Rafael, there's a grade that that goes up and then descends into where on the right is the Civic Center and beyond is Terralinda. Before the Civic Center, before Terralinda, if you took a left turn off of the two lane highway, it was Los Ranchitos, a place called Circle Road, and I lived on a little lane off Circle Road called Rainbow Road. And it was, and there, you know, fifteen houses or something like that. And that's why I grew up. I wasn't born there, but it was, it was the, you know, it was the post-war baby, just the beginning of it all. Mm. When people were building homes for themselves, like my parents did, and there's, you know, attractive, you know, lower-income housing, you know, on the, on the right, on the other side of the tracks, on, on the other side of 101, and uh, the school I used to walk to all the time, Santa Venetia School, and then. You know, past what the, the, the future location of the Civic Center, which I forget when I started building. But that's how far away and long ago it was. And I put in my book, at that time, the population in the United States was less than half of what it is now. Mm-hmm. And the world was a different place. Yeah. I read where you were, your, your father, I think it was, actually uh, made up Rainbow Road. He that's did. the name. Yeah. I looked up the map. Uh, it's on the map. I looked yeah. up uh, Google Maps and. There is a Rainbow Road, mm-hmm. and it is near Circle Road mm-hmm. and Oak View Drive. So maybe mm-hmm. they've made it, made it official. Yeah, it is. Ah. Because I went there a couple of years ago and uh, to scatter my mother's ashes, and rather than the hand-painted Rainbow Ride sign, there's one of those official metal, you know, street <laughs> signs. that Rainbow Road on it. Wow. You should have named it Winter Road. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, y- by sixth grade, you were already into, uh, I believe, music and writing. And you, this was around the time that you created your own publication, The Weekly Trumpet. Mm-hmm. Tell us a bit more about that. Uh, you had how many subscribers? I know, 40, 60 people, Diamond Issue, all around Circle Road, Rafael Meadows. And um, we did it for about six, eight months, you know. I think it was every other week. And, uh, was it well, me or just you? It was me and two friends of mine in ah. school. And at the end of the school, we, you know, we decided to shut down for the summer, and we had 40 bucks in a box, <laughs> split it up, and said we were going to come back in the fall as a, as a monthly magazine format thing. Let me come up <laughs> 10 years old. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, I missed the name, The Weekly Trumpet. Yeah. You know. Um, and you are already stealing from other publications, aren't you? <laughs> or like random notes? Well, that was later. I, uh-huh. Later. Oh, for Rolling Stone. Yeah. No, no, no. Wait. I, yeah, Rolling Stone stole from one of my earlier. Uh-huh. Okay. In high school, I started a student newspaper there. In addition, they had the official student newspaper, which, for, which was really for alumni, which I edited, called the Main Sheet. There was the Dolphin, which was the yearbook, which I edited. And then the, the theme of the school was not nautical. The, the headmaster was a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. So the Dolphins, the teams with the Mariners, and all this kind of stuff. So I started a newspaper when I was elected student body vice president, I pledged to start a student newspaper. And so we started it, it was called The Sardine. <laughs> 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 this is not getting off on your best foot with the uh, administration. 
And the sardine, the motto was, you know, all the news that fits the print. We had a column in that called Random Notes. So it lasted three issues. <laughs> I got kicked. I got banned. On, I mean, it was banned. <laughs> it was a mess. And when I was in Texas, in Amarillo, for one year with my father, who had a partnership uh, in a restaurant there on Route 66, the Ding Hao, you know, it was just he and I. And so I was often by myself watching Leave it to Beaver or listen to Elvis or in the office, typing out my own newspaper. <laughs> and the circulation was whichever waitress would read it. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice, Ben. Keep doing that. Yes. yes. But you kept doing it. And in Maureen Dowd's Deny or Confirm, she says, in high school, you added an N to your name. Was that Jan or Wenner that you added to? <laughs> Let's see. So you were Jan yeah, all those years? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Did you well, know no, that my pronounced Jan, but still, oh. but... It was J A N. It didn't, when I added it, it didn't help with the pronunciation anymore. No. I still Jan, you know. <laughs> but I thought it was cool. You know, that's it. Now I see people being named that, you know. Oh. Yeah. 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 Anyway. All that right. Um, in 64, you worked at the uh, Republican convention in San Francisco, right. uh, um, helping out with uh, Mr. Huntley and Mr. Brinkley. Right. And then around the same time, maybe just shortly thereafter, you had a real epiphany. Uh, at um, a sit-in demonstration where you heard the incredible voice of Joan Baez. Right. Tell us about that feeling. Well, I was a sophomore, and I was walking across the campus, and I was already involved in, you know, sort of radical politics, but, you know, in my own way. You know, it's a, uh, you know, not a full-out, you know, thing. But, um, you know, I was raised in a liberal Democratic part, uh, part family. And, um, you know, I was bopping along, having a nice time in college and getting good grades, and, you know, I had a lot of friends and fraternities and places, and I was kind of, like, ambivalent about what I was going to do with my life. Was I going to commit to this, or was I going to become a frat rat, or stick with, you know, whatever. And um, so I'm walking across the campus one day in early October, and there was a sit-in in front of Spr in Sproul Hall, and that plaza there, where about 3,000 students had trapped in the middle a police car, which was on campus trying to arrest somebody for doing something on a guy named Jack Weinberg who actually later went on, he was the guy who coined the phrase, don't trust anybody over 30. <laughs> Interesting. Um, probably should have been jailed. But anyway, they wouldn't let him, the crowd wouldn't let him go, so Joan was up there, and was, I've never seen her before, really heard her before, and with this voice, this, a voice of an angel, she's singing the Dylan song with God on my side. And the, the you know, the hypocrisy, which I was speaking of with earlier, I mean, she, it, the Dylan lyrics in that, you know, that you never ask questions with God on your side, and uh, so it comes, and finally, and, and, and even Jesus Iscariot had God on his side, you know. And it was just riveting and compelling, and it was, it was really an epiphany for me that, that the me this, meant so this meant something. It was so powerful that you had to do something about that. You, it, that is true. That does happen, and you must act if you've got that knowledge. And, and that was, for me, what I really identify as kind of my youthful epiphany and the need to now commit to stuff. And Spread the word yeah. through music, uh, which you did not probably do so well at the Sardine. No. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. uh, confirm or deny, you traded your tickets to the Beatles' last show, that would be August 1966 at Candlestick, for 30 hits of LSD. Ah, <laughs> uh, nah, never. That never happened, or you never don't remember happened. it happening. I don't remember. Yeah, I did, you know. Uh, <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> well, I, it, nobody could hear the Beatles show. They were screaming girls. It didn't matter what they were doing. I thought I had the best time. I went to Hawaii with 40 hits of acid and spent two months there. So, you know. Who needed them anyway? Yeah. I, right. So, anyway. Come back when you get hip. Um, a year or so later... Yeah, I'm speaking to a friendly audience, right? <laughs> was that? I was, I was I speaking to a friendly audience, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, this yeah, yeah. feels like a pretty they're, friendly dang crowd. Yeah. They're going to yeah. be a... Yeah. <laughs> we don't have pot stores, but we're here. Okay. <laughs> That's right. They're outlawed here still. Amazing. What? A year or so later, after this, uh, the uh, Beatles show you missed... <laughs> In the year, in the fall of 67, when the first issues rode off the press at 746 Brandon Street for Rolling Stone and you held an issue in your hands, did you know what you had created? I, well, I thought it was just, it was great. 
I, I mean, I'm really, I mean, it's 24 pages, cheap paper, you know, I, it lasts me thing. I said, God, this is so, we'll never get better than this. This is so good. <laughs> I really thought that. It's amazing to me that you worked so hard. I believe it took several months to create this first 24-page uh, tabloid. And you're saying, we're going to do this every other week. God uh, damn it. Well, then. And most national magazines were happy being a monthly. And look yeah, at you. Yeah. Uh, and then we didn't have, know what to do next. I mean, we really had nothing available. <laughs> <laughs> so we did a scramble. And I, Ralph and I had gone to see Ike and Tina turn to, 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 at the uh, Hungry Eye the week before. And so I had taken pictures of it. So I said, well, let's, we'll make that the front page story. So I reviewed the show in one column, and you know, Tina Turner and talked about that. And then Ralph somehow had gotten, somebody Columbia Records he knew had told him about that Dylan had, had recorded John Wesley Harden, which was his first album since the motorcycle accident. So we had that as a page one exclusive. And I don't know what else was in there, but it was, it was what Ralph called, it said what you do when you're down to seeds and stems. What? <laughs> you know, you roll uh, up your seeds and stems. Now that you say that, I remember that one of the items on the front page of one of the first issues was the firing of the program director of KFRC. Yeah. Uh, a top 40 station in San Francisco. Hey, you know, whatever fits. Yeah, but that, that was the first issue because the column on the right-hand side had, like, this much space left or something. So, yeah. well, what could we think of? A program director of Top 45, of course. Yes. Round, Tom Rounds fired it. Stop Airbnb. the presses. <laughs> right. Well, you, although you had a couple of pretty cool interviews early on, uh, I think Booker T might have been there. John Carpenter uh, submitted something from Los Angeles. You got into the uh, 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 art of the interview yourself pretty early on. And I'm wondering how you learned that, uh, aside from reading. Uh, how, were there mentors, models, magazines? Yeah, there was a, the Playboy interview, mm -hmm. which er I think everybody at that time was reading. And it was really good, serious, you know, long, in-depth thing about what you thought in your life and all that kind of stuff. And was that married to... The Paris uh, Review mm. interview, which Ralph turned me on to, where they interview writers about their writing habits and their styles and how they go, go about them, their technique. I mean, really from a professional point of view, you know, from a pro point of view. So it was a combination of those two, you know. Uh, and it, I, it became fascinating. My, the first one we ever run was the one from John Carpenter, it was Donovan, and uh, not run by us. I mean, not commissioned by us, but we bought it from. Them. And then I did, the first one I did was with Mike Bloomfield, mm -hmm. who was living in Mount Valley here at the time. And uh, he was a big idol of mine. And then after, somebody reminded me when I did that, I completely forgot. But the, the first big ones were Pete Townsend and Booker T and EMGs. And uh, we had a Mick interview by John Cott early mm -hmm. on. What was your research? How, what was, how, what was, how did you prepare you for these first musicians? You listen to records, you know, mm -hmm. carefully, and you read whatever is available, and you know, pick out areas you have to. You know, you have to really be organized, and you know, you're great at it, and you, know, you have to structure the interview in advance the way you want to go. And in the course of doing the interview, both be listening to the response, but also be figuring where you're going to go next, and looking for your next question, your list, and this one, this answer diverts that way. Be prepared. This. So. You're, it's never a relaxed situation for the interviewer. You know, no. just uh, you're on, you're, you're, you, and you've got to make this work. Right. Uh, but you have to go in very prepared. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned a couple. You can't of your just. I mean, yeah, right. People come and wing it. I mean, and I think the musician and the reasons our interviews always turn out so good is people we interview really respected that we came in prepared mm -hmm. and really the serious questions about they were actually doing, yeah. and not just keep the, you know. We're still at that point it's beyond the you know what are you looking for in a girl what's your favorite color and all that stuff, <laughs> but um, these kind of dumb questions going oh so you know what's it like or just how do you feel yeah I, I, dumb you know how is it how does it feel yeah <laughs> but given 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 respect they responded mm -hmm. they all responded yep that's what I tell uh, uh, students all the time that it's. Uh, respect, research equals rapport. Or, or, of course, you bring in your mm -hmm. own personality to it, but you want to keep the spotlight on the subject uh, and make them as comfortable <laughs> as possible. And comfort is research that you already know or what you're talking about. You're not asking the same old questions and being too obvious. Uh, then the other craft that you uh, um, were able to... Are those to the three R's? Well, that's just my own oh, oh. ideas. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. 
but uh, but you can borrow them. Oh, thank you. Yeah. In the next edition. Yes, you're right. Okay. Uh, how did no you, credit. And then being an editor, you know, people say, oh, an editor. All right, that's somebody who sits at a desk and uh, cuts up other people's work or calls for corrections or changes or rewrites or rejecting the uh, article. How did you know that you could be an editor in all the definitions of an editor? Um, I... I don't really, I mean, I had been doing it at, at high school. So mm -hmm. I'd been editing a newspaper and stuff like that. My mom had really taught me a lot about editing because she was a writer. And she told me, and I pass along to everybody, that first you have to have respect, then <laughs> you have to research. And, it would, <laughs> and I would tell everybody this. Flashback, flashback, flashback alert. <laughs> um, any case. Uh, you learned it I by doing it. Learned it by doing it. I had an instinct for what was a good story, and I knew about how to get the lead out. And one of the big things right, is you get somebody's copy, and then, you know, the lead, sometimes lead, sometimes lead's not there at all. And it's in a second paragraph, or the third, or four pages on. But you have to find that and then shape and give the story a point of view. And I knew you just wanted to, to be able to read the story way through and make sense. It just was natural to me. The thing that was magic was not the editing process per se, and I was a very good line editor as well as a conceptual editor and um, you know o over editor. But um, is is finding a story, knowing what a story is, and then matching with the right writer. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, then you got magic going on. And uh, and that was always the trick at Rolling Stone. You know, mm -hmm. many writers have their own ideas. Some don't. Some have bad ideas themselves. Some have good ideas. But matching it. With the right subject, then it, uh, you know, and so somebody comes along and just do that. If you can do that right and find the thing that inspires, then you, then then you're in the, you know, you're talking the top stuff. But matching with the right writers requires th those right writers being available to you and interested in working. As Rolling Stone grew, especially in reputation, you were able to attract more and more fine journalists fr from the daily press, from national mm -hmm. magazines, from other media even, and they would come to you and, and say, and pitch uh, a way to escape their doldrums and work for Rolling Stone. And although the media and the reviews have zoomed in on Hunter Thompson and Tom Wolfe as your major, uh, the writers you gave their careers a boost, the fact is that we should not forget people like Tim Cahill and David Felton, and John Burks, and Joe Esterhaus, and Chet Flippo out of Texas, Robin Green, and Timothy Krause, Jan Hotenfeld, and his brother Chris, plus wonderful designers and photographers, and of course, Annie Leibovitz, the one and only. And I, myself, as an editor, brought in a couple of kids, Cameron Crowe, Michael Gilmore, and my classmate at SF State, Paul Scanlon, who, as you said, became your first managing editor. That's a pretty good crop. It was an amazing crop, and it came some several uh, several ways. One was just serendipity, you know. Uh, a major way was people like Ben recommending friends, people they grew up in. It's amazing. All these people grew up together, and like Ben and uh, Paul, you know, were the core of the early Rolling Stone. You know, when I when I became editor, get, took over as editor uh, three years long. Ben and Paul were the two people running Rolling Stone, and me for the next you know seven or eight years. Others were people who just came in over the transom, like Esther House, you know, uh, while we, these were one of the bunch of daily editors, like Howard Cohn, you mentioned. Oh, and, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And David Weir. Mm -hmm. uh, and Felton were all like, you know, guys from the LA Times or the Detroit mm -hmm. Free Press, a uh, uh, Cleveland uh, Plain Dealer, who got in some kind, were, were looking for freedom and a higher bar and a place, and they read Rolling Stone. And they thought, Jesus, those people are doing it and they're getting away with that space and they came in and, and wanted to join us and they sought us out and so you know it it, it built upon it you know the certain services and then the people we sought out I sought out Tom Wolf I would be looking for other people and uh, and we became quite the factory for some of the best journalists of the times and um, and it went on and went on really to this modern day where we've had you know, Taibbi and a whole stack of people's names that, mm -hmm. you know, won't mention. But uh, we just always set a high bar and high standards. To be in Rolling Stone was really a dream of, of all these people, you know. 
and we were for tough and reporting and independent stuff and honest voice. You could say what you thought and write like you write well. So, you know, it's amazing. It was a great times to be with all this talent. I mean, wow. When we'd, we would spark. I mean, our editorial meetings, where the, <laughs> as I described there, where, you know, where all the editors would gather once a week with story ideas and shoot the shit and talk about stuff and sit around the room. And it was hysterical. It was funny. It was the funniest gag in the room would do and the best headline. And the headline running sessions were even worse. You know, and every right out to come up with these awful, insidious, nasty, <laughs> evil headlines. And I just, we'd work our way towards the right set of words, you know, and the thing to express it. And, and it was, and the fights that would go, it was, it was great. I always I mean, remember those uh, were the best times. Speaking of those headlines, meetings. speaking of headlines for uh, our uh, page Oral News Roundup, uh, David Felton was assigned to write a headline for a little story uh, about a kid who had been paid uh, about a five hundred thousand uh, dollar settlement because of an injury to his penis. <laughs> <laughs> and Felton read the story and said, "Okay, five hundred thousand dollars plus tip." <laughs> Genius. <laughs> Speaking of which, Hunter Thompson, will you pass his oh, wait, name can by? I, David yes. Felton, my, my favorite headline of all time, Felton wrote, was we had this, the famous issue with David Cassidy in it, on, and he was on the cover, mostly naked. And in addition to that, inside there was a rolling center with William Burroughs. So Felton's headline for the issue was, uh, Naked Lunchbox. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think you would operate at a level higher than that. Yeah. <laughs> Our most famous headline of all time was, though, when I wrote, uh, others have claimed the credit, but I did write it. We put Jim Morrison on the cover, yeah. and years later, years after he died, and, and, and said, he's hot, he's sexy, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Read all about it. Yeah. 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 But uh, let's not let Hunter Thompson's name go by without a story. Do you have a favorite flashy, um, kind of a flashback about him? His visits to your office, perhaps? It, you know, Hunter was just about as close to as much fun and enjoyment and pleasure that I've had in my life in terms of an editor. I mean, Hunter became a fast friend, a dear friend for a long time. We, we had a connection to each other as friends and as, as, as conspirators and as an editor and a writer that we totally understood each other and got it. And he was fabulously fun to be with. He had a wicked sense of humor. Loved to laugh, loved to do practical jokes and create outrages and just crack people up. At the same time, he was a Southern gentleman. He was the nicest guy. I mean, he may have seemed like all these other things, but he was a genuine guy. He was a, a flirt with all the women and a charmer and uh, you know, an extraordinarily special individual. So we had so many fun things together. I mean. Stealing signs off of restaurants and grocery stores, or blowing up fireworks on New Year's Eve in people's houses without them knowing about. I mean, just all kinds of pranks. Um, I, you know, and I, for me and for everybody, I think what you spent the time you spent with Hunter is the time you felt that you were ever the closest you were ever going to become come to the edge. Mm -hmm. You know, and experience that thrill and that danger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with Hunter. You could do it safely. I felt you could do it safely because I, he knew what he was doing. You know, it wasn't, there wasn't going to be an accident. There never was. Um, yeah. So, I mean, wow. I was blessed. And as you say, a gentleman. I Total remember gentleman. him being invited to some staff party at Nico's, a uh, Japanese restaurant on uh -huh. Van Ness. Uh -huh, I don't. And here we are all gathered together, hanging out, and there was Hunter standing off by himself in the corner, just quiet, mm -hmm. just observing, just having a drink. Speaking of very sociable types, uh, confirm or deny, says Ms. Dowd. Oh, Bob, let me say uh, one thing on yes. Hunter. Hunter's presence at the office also lifted everybody's game. <laughs> everybody recognized there was a star here, and everybody then aspired to lift their own stuff, they, to write, as, try and write, not as funny, but as sharp, as close as you do, as report, as well as he was a reporter, because it's superb, and to do something important, to mm -hmm. do something special. And he set the bar yeah. at that office. Right. Very good. Confirm or deny, Bob Dylan shakes hands like a dead fish. <laughs> well, he used to. I mean, when I first, not when I first met Bob, but along the way in the, you know, late 70s, mid 80s, something like that, we had had a very good initial relationship, and then he kind of disappeared. You did an interview with him, and when? Um, the uh, uh, 
tour with the band. So that was Plant Ways. That was a terrible yeah. record. That was, turned out to be an awful record. <laughs> that, but anyway, um, <laughs> it, you know, if, if he was trying to make you, you know, keep you on, on your toes or somehow belittle you a little or put you off your game, you know, somehow, because you're a big game player, you know, it, 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 he's, you stick out your hand like that, and he, give me your hand. Oh, gross. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> try it, try it. Everybody look to your neighbor, and one person, <laughs> don't make a grip. I mean, just have, grip your friend, and the other one don't, and it's creepy, you know? It's creepy. After the last so waltz, I, yeah. I, I learned not to, then I went through a period, of, and when I'd see him, I'd never stick out my hand. You know what I mean? Just forget it. But then in later years, we're now, we're on the b big hug bro braces, you know. Oh. And we see Bob, we're in each other's arms and oh. hugging it up and laughing. Right? And having a great time. He's a great guy in that, you know, if he likes you. And uh, <laughs> so he doesn't, he doesn't do that anymore. But I guarantee you he'll have read mm -hmm. this thing that Maureen said, and, it, and it's not put in the past tense. He's probably doing exercises now. <laughs> yeah, right, no, 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 no. Come he's on, he's stronger, young, stronger. He's going to go back to that then. Oh. You know, to defy you. Uh, Diane met him uh, backstage or at the party after the last waltz at the Winterland, Thanksgiving 1976, and mm -hmm. got the uh, semi-conscious fish treatment. Yeah, I mean, he just, yeah. All right. But Drugs. I, I don't find it all, I mean, now quite, di quite, quite different. No, good. I'm glad to hear that yeah. from Mr. Dillon. Uh, the Capri Lounge was the name of the uh, den in the New York offices of Rolling Stone where drugs were transactions took place. And before that, there was plenty of uh, weed and speed and coke in both San Francisco and New York. You got cocaine gifts from Keith Richards via Annie Leibovitz. Mm -hmm. what, was th what was the main appeal to you of oh. cocaine? Jesus. <laughs> it was free. Yeah, that it wasn't. I, look, everyone in the office except Ben was taking drugs. <laughs> Is that the truth? Is not the truth? You were not taking drugs. Um, I did not take drugs uh, during working hours. <laughs> and I worked 24 hours a day, so. <laughs> there you go. The worm has turned, my friend. <laughs> the worm has turned. <laughs> you can leave this room now. Because <laughs> my brothers and sisters are out there. Um, you know, it's just... You know, to take drugs, I mean, there's different categories of drugs. So you can speak of them, you know, as a general thing. I mean, I, pots, I, as everybody knows and has known for years, is, is completely harmless and is absolutely zilch compared to alcohol. You know, far safer, far healthier, and on and on. You know, LSD is its own thing. It's, you know, all the psychedelics. You know, I th think they're really good for people, but I think it has to be controlled. You know, I think government control of this is what we want and of drugs in general. We want quality controls. We want controls over you know, the, the amount of it and the dosage of it. And, and these things are best imposed by the government, by FDA or something like that. So I have no problem with that. Dr I think all drugs should be legalized. As to cocaine, which is another thing altogether, I think that's just a form of speed, finally. And I think that you know, speed is terrible for people. You know, I, don't, I just don't see it has really helped anybody mm -hmm. over the years. And I, I, as for my own use of coke and that kind of thing. I mean, at this point, I wish I had not done it. I would take it all back and rather have the money and have the time because it was, I mean, you had a little amount of good times and someone didn't drink and so on, but it just doesn't get you anywhere. And, you know, in the end, you, you, know, <laughs> you know, you drink a lot. It destroyed Hunter, destroyed David Crosby, destroyed lots, lots and lots of people. It's hard. Mm -hmm. That's an addictive, really addictive drug. Uh, and as Jimmy Buffett said, I was a quote in his book, he said, there's really nothing worth talking about after 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know? Before you got to know him, Bruce Springsteen exploded in 1975 with uh, Born to Run and was on the covers of both Time and Newsweek, <coughs> in case you kids remember magazines. In the same week, at 92NY, just a couple of weeks ago, he still didn't understand why Rolling Stone didn't have him on the cover, too. Did you give him a good explanation? No. I mean, <laughs> I didn't know it was coming that fast. And now, remember, my good friend and his manager, John Landau, didn't tell me. Uh, I mean, he had taken me to see Bruce, and I knew of Bruce, and I was really, in I loved, I thought he was great. But, you know, you didn't see, that was a highly unusual event they have 
any two, let alone a rock star and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, he was just joking. You know, he was just ribbing with me. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, who else has had him on the cover 26 times? Well, I'm know? here to confess that I had a role in his not getting onto the cover of Rolling oh, Stone oh. because I heard about Newsweek and Time and said, that's enough. Well, we don't want to jump on that wagon. I think that's good. That was let good judgment. them roll. Yeah, let yeah. them roll, and then we'll, we'll catch up in yeah. due time. Oh, that was good judgment. Thank you. I would have done the same. I'm hired again? <laughs> Is there a magazine in there? <laughs> <laughs> like a, you didn't track you two around? Let's see. There's that Herman's Hermits. Uh, yeah, right. That one. <laughs> Her, uh, you left, uh, Rolling Stone left uh, in 1977 from San Francisco, from 625 Third, partly because you wanted to grow the magazine. And at that time, Herb Kane, I believe, quoted you calling San Francisco a backwater town. Oh. You have said more, you've explained yourself more recently with the book that you felt you s that the city and the music scene had lost its energy. The, it had. Um, but I'll tell you how it all came about. Um, we, by 75 came around, we had an office in New York, an office in San Francisco. And the office in New York was growing and growing and growing. We had ad sales there. And the whole business side was moving there. And the creative and production side was here in, in, uh, in San Francisco. And... I was spending more and more time there uh, and going back and forth, back and forth all the time. I got in an apartment there and I was really liking it there. New York's a great town. And I felt like at home and comfortable there. So, it's, but, but I didn't like to, it's, I knew sooner or later I had to bring the two staffs together in one place. I mean, you can create so much more energy by having everybody. And it was uh, hindering our operations to have this communication gap across the country. At that time, you didn't have really much in communication. You had a telephone and a Xerox telecopter. Uh, so it was very hard to operate bifurcated like that. And the obvious choice was New York. I mean, that's where the magazine business is. That's where the talent was that we needed to grow with, the magazine people where they sell advertising or write or editors and the whole thing. I mean, there's no national magazine in San Francisco. There never was Saturday Review or Psych Today. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, Sunset in Menlo Park and Playboy in Chicago. But you didn't have, you know, the national magazine, if you want to grow, if you're ambitious like I was, you went there. And by this time, we were already a big-time magazine, half a million Cirque and big advertising, big stories. And so if this is really that, what, when I left San Francisco, <laughs> there wasn't a note about it in the papers or a goodbye or, you know, there's something snippy from Herb Cain. And whereas I got to New York, and there's a big stories in the New York Times about us coming to town, and there's so big stories. And it was exciting for everybody in New York City. Looking back on it, I realized that Simultaneously, and this is one of these many quinces in that my life that convinced me that I would be a good vehicle to tell the story of the era. Uh, the cultural center of the United States, which had been in San Francisco for a long time, for about 10 years, you know, it was a, the music scene, the political scene, the drug scene, paint, and, you know, all sorts of stuff was going on here. The, this, the lifestyle, the laissez faire attitude towards life was located here, and it's what gave birth to us. And But uh, it had run its course in, in many ways. And, and just as a matter of age, you know, I mean, the dead had all dispersed and we're all living in Marin and throughout. And uh, numerous examples. The mm -hmm. airplane had become the Jefferson Starship and, you know, the, the cover, the next cover they did for Rolling Stone in New Yorkers there was all airbrushed and blowers in the studio. And the, looking, you know, like, you know, any, you know. So that, it's not that the spirit left San Francisco. I mean, everybody continued to here, but <coughs> we had another agenda, so uh, it, it worked out really well. I mean, it worked out culturally really great. It was good. It was a it changed Rolling Stone quite a bit in the initial stages of it, uh, but it was also changing with the culture of the uh, the times. You know, uh, rock and roll in the late seventies had kind of gotten worn out, yeah. and it was a time when the punk rock started and disco started. And these weren't the they were all fine in their ways, but weren't the time the mainstream rock stars. And when it started up again, the mainstream rock stars were in, you know, all around the country and in New York, but not in San Francisco. I mean, who was mainstream big rock star in San Francisco at that time? None, I don't think. Hot tuna? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> there you I go. don't know. Yeah. Uh, so you catapulted into New York and beyond. I'm just going to just, um, without asking you true or false, just to s note that at a... L a luncheon in the Kremlin, Raiza Gorbachev serenaded you and Yoko Ono with a few lyrics from John Lennon's song, Woman. That is a cool sounding moment. Yeah. I was going to ask you what artists got away from you, and I think you already <coughs> said Elvis. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
it was done as a, may, not totally, I mean, it would have been great to do Elvis. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether it worked out or not because, I mean, yeah. he was kind of closed off and yeah. script, I don't know. By the mafia. I agree about Elvis. I would add Carol King. Uh, I never got to, but then young Cameron came to the rescue. But we didn't print it, did we? I think. I, I don't think, think so. because Annie went up and shot her in Sun Valley and came back with a picture mm. of Carol. I mean, it's very distinctly wearing long underwear <laughs> and staying out in the snow because she lived up yeah. north of us in Sun Valley. And we had a great story, maybe it was by Cameron. I think so. And mm. she wanted this picture on the cover. And I said, well, no, we're not going to put you on the cover. Oh. You know, we'll run the picture inside, but we're not giving you the cover. Mm. And uh, she said, well, then don't run the story. Oh. I said, okay. But Cameron and did get the interview, at least. Yeah. Okay, we're out of time uh, for... Uh, your, I had only about 20 other questions, but now <laughs> we have a, a, a few from the, uh, the audience. Okay. You're up for that? Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, we'll do the Bruce Springsteen thing and just make up our own questions. I, okay, you could okay. do that. All right. Oh, yeah, Ben, yawn impersonation, please. No. <laughs> I never, never did yawn, right? As far as you know. As yeah. far as I know, yeah. <laughs> There's a first. Hmm? There's always a first time. There always is a first time. Okay, I'm gonna study the tapes of this session, uh, and then I'll, I'll have you down. Uh, I, I, but I can do Bill Graham. You can do all my parts. So do Bill. Do, do Bill. Bill. Mr. Winner, <laughs> out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here all week. <laughs> I was 12 when I read that famous 1971 interview with John Lennon. It blew my mind. Had you any idea he'd be so brutally honest and forthcoming and drop so many F-bombs? Well, um, no. I mean, <coughs> I, there was hints that, no, I had no idea. I mean, he, when he came up to San Francisco to visit us the first time, he had been coming from L.A. where he was doing primal therapy with this kind of psychological thing running there where he screamed out your anger and reg regress to childhood and all this stuff. So he was definitely into this at the time and to telling the truth and getting all, all that. So there's that as a background, but uh, I was not prepared for him being so bitter mm -hmm. and also being so angry about Paul McCartney mm -hmm. and his, the Eastmans. And they were in the middle of a financial battle at the time and you know, it was a breakup, and John was a, 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 a angry guy. And he was bitter about his youth, and um, he was bitter about being trapped by the Beatles. And I, I was very sh shocked by it. Nonetheless, it remains the truth of the Beatles. That interview is one of the you know, great rock and roll documents and, and integral to the history of the Beatles. But it's shocking you know, how strong it is. And the, the current edition of it is out. Yoko wrote the introduction to it, and she said how, you know, we were all kind of like looking back at how, you know, tough it was, but it was true, it was real stuff. Yep. It's almost one quarter of a century since hip hop sales passed rock and everything else. Is rock dead? I don't think rock is dead by any means, but I think it's just, it's not the central music anymore. There's all kinds of different, hip hop is one of a bunch of, different musical styles and genres that are successor to rock that mix back in. I mean, you know, rock is this role as this big river of that keeps on rolling and all these influences, country rock and raga rock and folk rock and this rock and, you know, all come into it and it all kind of mushes together again. But it, it, rock and roll, the classic rock and roll that we know and we embrace is not the dominant thing anymore for young people. The people who are putting out now are kind of not on towns, but the lesser of towns. I mean, we went through this period of great, extraordinary genius that dominated for a long time. The audience for it, classic rock is aging, as we are. The younger people, I mean, the young people, you know, if you're kids, whatever, they don't really want to go to a concert and see a 70 year old guy bop it around, you know. I mean, you know, and that's what the rock and rollers are these days, 60 and 70 years old. They want to see somebody their own age. And, and then I think also the Technolo the technology in the music has altered the sound of music mm. and what you could do with music. And it's for different ear and it's created different sets of ears for a different generation. What we, if we listen to the Stones now or Bob, now, whatever it is, it's, it's, and if you're used to 
hip hop or modern pop with all the synthesizers and auto tuners and drum machines and it kind of sounds as it sounds antique. You know, it's almost it's it it's not mixed as diff as well. It's not stuffed as many. It's a, just a different sound of the ears for and for young people. It just it sounds to me like it would sound like Frank Sinatra sounded to me when I was young. On the other, and so I don't. I, it's not that it's dead, but I just think it's, you know, push. It'll be a, it'll be like jazz or classical music. It'll stick around forever. It's great music. There's great stuff, and it's not that it's losing its listenership. I mean, one of the best things about technology, which I think has been great for music, is that this music of our youth, uh, that we revere so much, and the Beatles and so forth, is available, 24 hours a day, everywhere around the world, free. Free. Remember before all this, the CD, if you bought a CD, it was 15 bucks. So no kid is going to go, well, you know, want to 15 bucks to hear the Beatles, you know. Now everybody knows them. My kids know that my, my 14 year olds sing Beatles songs. I'm going, where did you learn Here Comes the Sun? I mean, why? And so I think that it'll thrive. You know, it'll continue to stay alive, it'll continue to be an important tradition. Yeah, can someone from the bookstore tell me how we're doing on time? Are we, should we be down to the last, say, five, six minutes? Yeah. Yeah, you're down to the last five. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, before we go on, I just want to say congratulations to you because uh, into adulthood, you had had so much freedom and independence and, and, and fun, and then suddenly, somehow, you decided it's time to have a family. And boy, did you have a family. <laughs> <laughs> you got a six-pack. Yeah, really. Um, I just, you know, I always liked kids, always wanted to have kids, you know, just cherish family, cherish little kids. And, uh, I, but I guess in a way it was appropriate to wait till I was 40 because, I mean, up until that time I was so busy running around the world doing all this and living this and taking so many drugs. And I would have possibly been a terrible parent, not around. And uh, the minute you have a kid, if you want to see your kid, you better start getting up in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, no sleeping until 11. You'll, you'll miss the entire life. Getting home at 7 doesn't work. So... Uh, you know, immediately that became my priority, you know, as the kids. I just love it. Yeah, they're beautiful. The uh, t two questions for the price of none here now, they kind of tie in together. What was your strategy for managing Hunter Thompson? And, hey, Jan, is it true that you had to drive a case of wild turkey and boxes of grapefruit to the Seal Rock Inn to get Hunter S. Thompson to finish Fear and Loathing on the 72 campaign trail? Well... I didn't drive them myself. Maybe I did. I don't. He wrote. He fin tried to finish it up out there, not successfully at the Seal Rock, uh, which was about as far away in San Francisco as you can get from anything. Because people dropping by and visiting Hunter and all the groupies had were totally counterproductive. You could waste the entire time. And then you see same groupies always be telling me how I should make Hunter get more productive and give me their secrets, you know, on how to work with Hunter. Uh, but uh, my, you know. My strategy for Hunter and for, you know, for talent in general, and my understanding of talent, which I think also contributed to our ability to work with musicians and make Rolling Stone attuned to musicians, is that, you know, talent is, is you know, special stuff. Everybody's got it to some degree. And then your, your job is to nurture it, you know, and bring it out. Your job is not to tell it what to do. Your job is to steer it in a direction that you that intends to go in on its own, and and your job is to give it give it that steering, just so, so it goes in the same direction it intended to. It sounds cuckoo, but you know you got to suss out what it is about, what it wants to do, how what's what's the best way. And after a, a while, you you there's certain common things come across all the time. But some people you know need deadlines, some people don't. You know, there's all kinds of different things. All of it's kind of individual. You know, you just, you just have to respect it. I just want to put some music into your head <coughs> because uh, Maureen, uh, the wonderful New York Times writer, asked for your Desert Island Discs and you offered uh, Nina Simone, Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood, Mark Knopfler, Speedway at Nazareth, The Ghost of Tom Joad by Bruce Springsteen, Moon Dance by Van Morrison, I've Been Loving You Too Long by Otis, Desolation Row by Bob Dylan, Crying by Roy Orbison, Think by Aretha, Beautiful Day by You Two and Under My Thumb by The Stones and Imagine by John Lennon. Nice list. Thank Very you. good list. 
And my artists, um, if I had to hold it down to just uh, like you did, uh, Van the Man, Elvis, the Temptations, Boss Gags, Everly Brothers, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, Stones, Lady Gaga, Shelby Lynn, Dire Straits, Linda Ronstadt, Gladys Knight and the Pips, Ray Charles, Marvin Gaye, and the Beatles, and finally, Amy Winehouse. That is a narrow down. That is good. Now, last question. From last question, and thank you very much for your questions. Uh, John, what is your dream dinner party guest list? <laughs> Quite similar. Besides the same. Me. The same list. Yeah. The same ah, list. Okay. There you go. That you could do uh, worse. Yeah. Uh, I was, it, you asked this question when your ten favorite. How do you do that? How yeah, you can't? I, I, I mean, hate that. Yeah. No, I, mean, I didn't want to answer it, but yeah. she kept pushing it away. And then, honestly, Matt helped me with the list a lot. And then she said, do you really want to do Under My Thumb? I mean, it's so misogynistic. I mean, <laughs> well. I, you know, and she was looking after me. I mean, you, be careful when you say that. Under My Thumb It's a girl who once had me down. You know, it's down to me. Yes, it is. The difference in the clothes she wears. You know, all that <laughs> stuff. And I said, just fuck it. It's a great song. I mean, <laughs> have you heard? Clearly, that, that, you memorized that, it. That, <laughs> that organ part. Do, 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 do. The rhythm is fantastic. So fuck it, you know. <laughs> fuck it. That's right. <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you.